All right. What a wonderful time of worship this morning. Amen? Man, that was good. That last song is one of my favorite all-time hymns. I grew up uh, singing hymns down in a little church I went to in Louisiana, and uh, just some of those songs, man, just... They just don't get any better than that, right? And thank you guys. Thank the worship. I just want to thank the worship team for just doing a phenomenal job. And Mike and Larry back there with those guitars just bringing extra uh, uh, things to that song. Praise the Lord. Uh, Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. And uh, by the way, while you're... Turning there, my name is Jason Robertson, one of the pastors here at Huntington Beach Church. We're so delighted to have all of you that are here in person. It's good to be back in person, and, uh, and this year has is, is just been an exciting year for that. People able to come back each week, getting more and more people back. And then also we welcome all those who are watching online and are tuning in uh, through our app or website or the YouTube and things of that nature. And if you have your app, as we heard uh uh, we'll talk about it this morning. You can open that, and you'll find our sermon notes in the app. And uh, so you, you can uh, make yourself available to those to uh, help you take notes on today's message as we continue our study uh, that we've been doing verse by verse through the book of Acts. And last week we were, um, actually it was two weeks ago, we were in Acts chapter uh, 19, and we were talking about the story of Paul going to Ephesus. And uh, I want to pick up on that story today, and you'll see here uh, on, the, on the screen uh, some of the photos of Ephesus. We have, uh, of course, this is modern-day Ephesus. Didn't look like that back in Paul's day, of course, but uh, a, a beautiful seaside city. And uh, it was absolutely beautiful, and there was a lot of great architecture there. You're going to see a slide come up here called the Celsus Library which is built on top of a tomb of a man named Celsus, thus the name of the library. It was one of the few libraries in the ancient world, and you can still go and visit, you know, at least the front wall of that library to this day. And then also here's an artist's rendering of the Temple of Artemis that was in that city, the Temple of Artemis, also known as the Temple of Diana. And uh, the legend has it that some meteor had fallen out of the sky and had landed near Ephesus, and it was in the shape of uh, one of these uh, goddesses uh, that they worshipped back then, and in particular, uh, Artemis. And so they built this shrine, eventually built this temple, and it was a magnificent temple. It was one of the, the most magnificent buildings of the ancient world. And so... Uh, We talked about that a lot a couple of weeks ago, how people would go into this temple and be a part of pagan worship. There was prostitution uh, inside the temple. It was was called temple prostitution. It was a very weird pagan form of worship. And so when people from all over the, the, the country would come to Ephesus and they would see these large buildings and, and they would see all that was going on and then they would go into places like this temple and worship. I said a couple weeks ago, it was kind of like the ancient Las Vegas. You know, it was, it was out of this world. It was something that people went to and, and, uh, and it, was, it was other than. And it was also other than in, in the depth of sin and, and evil things that were going on there. And we looked at that uh, all uh, and a couple weeks ago, and we saw that right in the middle of this city was a group of believers known as the Way. The Way. The first half of chapter 19 describes how Paul met with this church plant called the Way, and he actually got to a point where he was teaching daily in this church plant daily teaching for a couple of years, and eventually, after a lot of weird, strange things were going on, uh, he got kicked out of the synagogue, there was demonic activity, there actually, things got violent in the city as as they were facing some of this stuff, and eventually there was this city-wide impact of the gospel that took place. So notice Acts chapter 19 and verse 20 This is the uh, verse that we ended on a couple of weeks ago. It says, so the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. 
It was a great moment in chapter 19. After all Paul had done for several years, eventually God in his own way, in his own timing, according to his own wisdom and providence and sovereignty, God brought about the fruit of the harvest and and this church began to blossom. And so today, I want to now deal with the second half of Acts chapter 19. And here's what I'm going to do. First of all, I'm just going to explain to you the story because it's kind of a long story and a lot happens. So give me a chance just to explain to you the story. In other words, just a little Bible teaching, okay? We're going to just kind of work through it and we're going to learn what the Bible says, what the story is all about. Then at the end, I just want to draw out from that Bible story the wisdom that I believe God has for us and for why he put that story in the Bible. So first we're going to just work through it, and then at the end we'll give you the the wisdom that you can draw from it. So let's look at it. Verse number 23 of Acts 19. It says, about that time, what time? About the time that this great citywide movement was taking place, there arose a great disturbance about the way. It began with Demetrius a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. He kept many craftsmen busy. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Uh, Not always the most accurate translation, but it's very good for telling a story because it just keeps it simple. And so I want you to pick up on what's going on here, a great disturbance. This is how the Bible describes what happened in Ephesus, a great disturbance. A local businessman gets really upset. Now, great disturbance, that's, you got to think if you were in modern times, It would be front page paper. You'd be on the front page of of the Orange County Register or some of the local outlets. Uh, you, You might say things like, you know, social media was blowing up. There was this great disturbance. And I know a lot of people aren't comfortable with controversy. Some of you just aren't wired that way, and that's okay. Not everybody, you know, is, is on the earth to do the, the same thing. God has some of us that are doing certain things, some of us that are doing other things. So not everybody likes controversy, but there are times when you just can't get around the controversy. And this is one of those times. A great disturbance took place. Everybody was getting involved. It was just the reality of the moment. And so what happens is this guy, Demetrius, who was a silversmith. Notice he's, he's making little shrines. Go back with me um, uh, one, one slide there, fellas. There you go. He's a silversmith, and he's making these silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. So you got that big temple in town. Everybody goes to worship there. And so this is kind of one of those, you know, you go and you can go into the local shops in Ephesus and, and get a little statue of Artemis, the goddess Artemis, the goddess Diana. So instead of going into the temple, you could get a little one and bring it home, you know, kind of like at the gift shops, right? You can get you a little uh, statue and take it home and worship the goddess at your house. Well, this guy, Demetrius, he was making bank on this stuff because he was a silversmith. So he was making little silver statues, and he was selling them to the local businessmen. Notice he kept all the little craftsmen busy. He had, he had all these guys working for him, and they had a big business going on. And so now, with this great disturbance happening, and people getting saved, and people turning to Christ, what are they doing? They're, they're not buying the little statues anymore. In fact, we noticed a couple of weeks ago, some of them were taking all of their stuff that, uh, were, uh, that was ungodly and everything, t- took it into the city and made a big bonfire and started burning all. Some of them had those black magic books. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. So they were repenting and they were cleaning out their house. And here's a guy locally that this was affecting him. It was affecting his bottom line. So he gets upset and he begins to appeal to the citizens. Now go to the next slide. Verse number 25, it says, he called them together along with other employed, others employed in similar trades, and address them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. Stop right there. Notice, he's basically appealing to their pocketbook. Money talks. That's how the world works. Everything, just follow the money, right? 
and he's appealing to this. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, this whole Christian thing is not good for business. It's not good for business. Now, I want you to just, let's just pause. I, we're going to get to some wisdom at the end of this thing that I want you to write down. But, I mean, I just can't go past this point of thinking about, this is such a good example of how the world works. The world is designed to take advantage of anything it can take advantage of in our lives. It, it's designed, businesses are designed to take advantage of your insecurities, of your superstitions, of your addictions, right? All the things that are bad for you that you wish you could quit, the world is actually making bank on it. They don't want you to quit. You see, here's a guy in town. Everybody in town is doing a lot better now, knowing God instead of a fake goddess. But this guy's upset. Why? It's bad for business. Christianity frees you from the traps of the world. Christianity will set you free from all the things that people are making money off of you with, you see. You see a good example of that right here. You know, and he goes around, and he's getting all these businessmen together, and he says, listen, you know, these Christians, they don't care about us. They don't care that they're costing us money. They're bad for our city. Let's go to the next verse. Verse 26, he, he's, he steps up his argument. He says, but as you have seen and heard, this man, Paul, has persuaded many people that handmade gods are not really gods at all. <laughs> I got to stop there. What? I mean, is this not the perfect example of the problem with the world? I mean, it's almost like I can't believe he just said that. I can't believe he just said, you know, our problem is Paul's convincing everybody that handmade gods are not really gods. Like, no, dude, you didn't say that. It, th that's the problem in the world. It's so illogical. If you pay attention, if you're informed, if you stay read up and watch and stay in touch with what's going on, the, the, the world's just ignorant in many ways, right? The world is just filled with so much ignorance, misinformation, weird illogical thoughts and ideas and theories that if you watch it and you study it and you look and you pay close attention, it's like you're, you, sometimes you think to yourself, how do people say this stuff? Not only say it, there's people making money off of this stuff. Oftentimes, I don't get mad at them. I get mad at us. It's like, why? how can we be so dumb to buy into this, right? That they're getting our good money. Handmade gods are real gods. Let's sell that to the world. Handmade gods are real gods. Seriously. But look, we may look back on these people and say, well, you know, they were, this was ancient 2,000 years ago. They didn't have our, you know, colleges and our, and our schooling and our education, and, and they didn't have the internet. And they weren't as smart as us. Come on, folks. I remember growing up in school, and they, they tried to convince me of, uh, that, that we all evolved from monkeys. Do you remember that? How many of you were taught that in school at some point? All across the room. Remember that? I mean, even though we have absolutely no DNA of apes in us at all, they, can, they, they literally taught us that it was fact. They called it the evolutionary theory, but they, they forget to tell you that a theory is not really fact. It's just somebody's guess, right? Scientific theory, right? But we bought into that. Some of you in here are engineers and scientists. You, some of you work for uh, some of the space programs and things. You know that some of the smartest people in our city still believe that we evolved from, you know, some type of little slime creature or whatever. And they're smart. They're smart people. But this is how the, the world becomes so illogical that you have to really slow down and say, did you really just say that? 
Of course, the, the most uh, popular theory going around is this whole gender dysphoria stuff, right? That a guy, a male, can have gender dysphoria, and if he feels like he's a female, then he's a female. That's, that's illogical, folks. He's got absolutely every chromosome in that guy's body is male. Every single chromosome in his body is male. He has male appendages. He was born a male. He will die a male no matter how many surgeries he gets. And yet the world says, no, 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 no. If he feels like he's a female, then he's a female. And people have bought into that wholesale. Wholesale. I'm not here to put down the people who are going through the issue and are having confusion because here's a little secret. Everybody has issues. Amen? Every one of us grew up with issues and confusion and dysphoria. I'm glad my dad didn't know what the word dysphoria was when I was a kid. I would have got labeled with that for sure because we all get screwed up at times in our thinking, right? But here's the problem with the world. The world, instead of saying, let's help that person, they said, no, let's, let's make a career off of this. Let's write a new, you know, article to put into psychology today. Let's, let me do my doctorate on this, and I can sell books and become an expert and make a living off of this stuff. It's the same thing that was going on 2,000 years ago in Ephesus when these guys were going around selling these little shrines, making money off of it. All of a sudden, a citywide revival took place, and everybody got upset. It's a great disturbance took place. And what's, what's ironic is the world calls Christians non-inclusive. And this is exactly the opposite, right? We're the ones, because of what Christ has done in us, we love everybody. We literally love, every, in fact, Jesus has taught us to love our enemies, right? I mean, we love people we don't even like. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and it's because of God in us, right? It's, it's because of what God's done in our heart. Yet they call us non-inclusive. They call us anti-science, anti-science. And yet we're worshiping the God who created all the laws of science. We got more respect for science than anybody else. Right? They call us hateful, and the last thing we do is try to hate anybody because we've had a God that has loved us when we were unlovable and we didn't deserve it, and he went to the cross and he died for us and he paid for our sins and, he, and he's taught us grace, and yet we're called these names, and it's just not true. So back to the story. I'm trying to hold all the wisdom to the end of the sermon, but I can't do it. All right, so here we go. Back to the story. People were getting saved. They stopped buying their idols. Christ has now replaced Diana. True worship has replaced false worship. And I mean, literally, come on, folks. These guys are getting saved, and they're getting rid of their statues, a statue, a little trinket. I mean, if you drop it, the little arm breaks off. You know what I'm saying? You're like, oh, no, my God just lost his arm. And you replace that for a living Holy Spirit that has come into your life that is real, that is with you. You sense the presence of a living God. You go from a, 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 having a little trinket hanging from your mirror in your car to now you've got, you've got God himself in your heart, in your actually with you at all times. You go from superstition to now you've got a Bible and you're studying objective truth. Not just what you feel or what somebody says, but now you've got God's word that you can study line by line and come to know truth. This is what's happening. And in the middle of all of this, Demetrius has got all these business people riled up, and they began to get so angry and so upset, and a riot formed. Now, we know a lot about riots now after 2020. We see how people just get all worked up and get mad and get angry and take advantage of situations. This is what happened. I want you to see the Ephesus Theater. If you could put that slide up. The Ephesus Theater was carved into the side of a mountain there in Ephesus. And I put this arrow there to show you that down in the center of that theaters where what's about to take place takes place. They're going to, all this crowd, this riot. Remember, 25,000 people can fit in this theater. 
So the city is showing up, and they're angry at the way and at Paul. And notice what happens in verse 28. It says, at this, their anger boiled, and they began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So you just kind of picture, they're all in there shouting. They're clapping their hands. They're stomping their feet. Great is the goddess Diana. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And soon the whole city was filled with confusion, the Bible says. And everyone rushed into the amphitheater. Down in verse 32, inside the people were all shouting, some one thing and some another. Everything was in confusion. In fact, most of them didn't even know why they were there. Seriously, sometimes you're like, really? That's exactly what we saw a year ago, right? I mean, I can just picture Jesse Waters doing interviews on the street in Ephesus, right? Man on the street, hey, why are you here? I don't know. What are you shouting about? I don't really know. What happened? I was just down at McDonald's, and now I'm here. But uh, great is, what's her name? Artemis. Great is Artemis, right? This is what happened. Some were yelling with the cause. Some were just yelling. Can I just stop and say, I hope it doesn't, I know you guys don't get offended. You guys aren't those kind. But the world is filled with a lot of dumb sheep, Right? Just people that will follow the crowd. People that get caught up in the hysteria. People that don't think for themselves, right? Are you with me? Some are shouting. They're literally getting violent. There's confusion everywhere. They're angry. And remember, this is all over money. It's all about money. It's all about the local politics of the town. And so this thing gets out of hand. I mean, people are going to get hurt. This thing has gone way beyond what anybody could imagine. You got all kind of people jumping in and getting involved. You got people showing up, don't even know what the cause is, but they're there anyway, which means they'll do anything. This is just fun for them. This was just better than being out in the field, you know, following you know, the goats around or whatever they were doing outside of Ephesus, right? So it's like, let's head to town. There is a huge, you know, thing going on, and they get involved. So this thing's out of hand, bro. It is, it is headed towards something terrible. So this is interesting. The city officials get involved. Go to verse 35. At last, the mayor was able to quiet them down enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, he said, everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple of the great Artemis whose image fell down to us from heaven. Since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm and not do anything rash. Verse 37, you have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and they have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session. They need to make formal charges. And so basically the mayor just tells them the legal uh, process that they ought to handle this. And you get down to verse 41, and the crowd dispersed. So I want to just look at this. The official shows up, and he makes a legal case. Uh, this, this is the only guy that had any sense in the story. He said, wait a minute, this is not right. It's not legal. The Christians aren't hurting you. The Christians aren't hurting your goddess. The whole thing is baseless and illegal. So that's, that's what happened in Ephesus. As you know, a couple of years later, Paul writes a letter to this church, and we call it the book of what? Book of Ephesians. So this is how it all got started. So that's the story. That's the story. Now, if you want to write down a couple of takeaways today, here's some wisdom that we learn. I want to go back to verse number 23. If you could put verse 23 up, it says, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. And now you know what that disturbance looks like, about 
the way. Notice, I just like the name of this church, the way. Number one, the way is about direction, not destination. It's about movement, not moments. Hey, they named this church really good, the way, the way. It's about a direction, not a destination. Movement, not moments. Movements are different from mo moments is where'd you go to church this morning at 1030? That was a moment. You were in service, a worship service. Movement is about your life, the way of life. It's more than just a moment. It's who you are. Moments are, I am forgiven. I trusted in Jesus Christ and he forgave me of my sins. A movement is, I am free from the bondage of sin. I no longer have to think the way the world thinks. I no longer have to be duped by the illogical stuff of the world. Because now that I've been forgiven and set free, God has opened my mind. Now I can think for myself. I can be responsible for my own life. I, 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 can, I don't have to be a dumb sheep anymore, you see. Destination versus direction. Destination is whenever people say, I'm a Christian, what does that mean? It means when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's the destination. It's true, but it's way more than that. It's about a direction. God didn't just save you to get you to heaven. He saved you so that he could redeem your life, so that he can give you a lifestyle on this earth that brings him glory. God saved you not to get you to a destination, but to make you someone who glorifies him on the journey. He gives you a worldview. He has set you apart from the world and giving you clarity of thought and, and a clean heart and a clean conscience so that you can go on a way with him. I'm really just trying to drive home the point that, that this is why Christianity is so important. This, this is why, right here, this right here, this point, this is why Christianity is so important. In, in other words, if you've ever sat around wondering these days, why would anybody come to church? Why, why with all the things that are out there in the world, I mean, you've got access to all sorts of help, all sorts of resources. If you're looking for community and trying to hang out with people, there's all kind of clubs and things you can get involved in out there. There's all sorts of entertainment. There's all sorts of classes, and, and you can now, you don't even have to go to college anymore. You can just log in to college. You know what I'm saying? You can get, you, you've got access. Why, why in the world would any smart, reasonable person get involved in what you're doing this morning? You ever asked yourself that question? Have you ever wondered if you're the weird one, right? <laughs> uh, I guess I'm the only one that thinks that, but I guess I just answered my question. I guess we are the weird ones, but no, we're not. Here's the thing. You've got an option out there of going with the world, no matter how it looks or feels in the moment. At the end of the day, it's going to waste your life with destructive habits. Or you can live this life, the Christian life, which gives you meaning and purpose. You can be part of the world and be headed toward becoming victimized with lies and being around liars who are only thinking about themselves and they will use you and abuse you. Or you can be part of the way which was thriving in truth and freedom. You can be part of the world which is burdened with guilt and condemnation. Or you can be part of the way which has continual forgiveness and cleansing. I think about this with my own children. I, I think about my kids and I'm like, I hope they choose the way rather than the world. Because the world is a life that is constantly falling apart. 
It's constantly falling apart. When you live the way of the world, when you live in the world according to its philosophies, no matter how successful you are, no matter how much money you make, no matter how educated you are, whatever that is, it just seems like the, your life will constantly break and fall apart because it has no foundation. It's built on, as Jesus said, it's built on sand. It's going to crumble. No matter how good, how smart, how, no matter all, all those advantages you may, nope, doesn't matter. You can choose that way or you can be part of the way, the Christian way, which is a life of spiritual healing and spiritual restoration constantly going on. The world is suffering in injustice and defilement. That's why I think they're so angry. That's why I think the world is so quick to riot. That's why I think with just the drop of a hat, people get involved and stuff like that. Don't even know why. It's, what are you angry about? I don't know. I'm just angry. That's what it means to live in the world. It will beat you up, and it will make you bitter, and it will make you angry, and it will make you broken, or there's an alternative, and that's what we're doing right here this morning, getting into the Word of God and walking with our Lord and Savior Jesus, which is a way of justice, a way of peace, right? You see, this, this is why Christianity matters. Number two, I take away from this story that the way is based on biblical truth, not moral platitudes. Remember, these, the way had been around for a couple of years, preaching every day the Word of God. Remember that story from two weeks ago? Every day they were teaching the Word of God. So that when all of this chaos happened, they were fine. They were, they were absolutely okay. If you read the story, I mean, nothing bad happened to them. The people were fine. In fact, Paul, if you read deeper into the story, when everybody was in the theater trying to have this riot, Paul was standing outside saying, let me go in there and talk to them. Let me go talk to them. And all of his friends were like, no, Paul, don't go in. They're going to just, they may kill you in there. And he's like, I don't, no, listen, I can win this argument. There's 25,000 angry people in there, Paul. No, it doesn't matter. I got God. Amen. Me and God, we're, we're the majority. Let me go in. I've got truth on my side. Now, if he was just one of these mega church preachers that have all the little moral platitudes, you know, just the little cute sayings on how to be a good person, the little self-help sermons, they'd have never survived Acts 19. They'd have never survived it. They would have closed their church down, right? Right? Don't tell me they wouldn't because we saw it happen last year. With a little bit of pressure from the world, churches closed all over, scared to death of what was going to happen to them. Scared of the government, scared of the culture canceling them, scared to do anything. Right? But that's not the way this church was. They were brave. They were in the word. They knew the truth. They had the answers. They were ready for the moment. Number three, put this on the screen. The way is known for who they follow, not what they're against. Did you pick up on the fact that the mayor said, hey, this church hasn't stolen anything from the temple. The church hasn't spoken out against your goddess. Did you notice that, that he said that? That, that jumped off the page at me. It means that this church wasn't known for being political or it wasn't known for what it was against. It wasn't the anti-group in town that was against this and against that and against it. it wasn't, they weren't mean people. They weren't jerks in town. They didn't go around, you know, knocking over everybody's statues saying, you know, that's stupid, that's stupid, you know. I mean, you probably were thinking it, but they didn't do it because they were learning how to be gracious and kind, right, and be merciful and patient. They were learning all this stuff. So out in the community, they had this great reputation. They weren't known for what they were against. They were known for who they were for. Who were they for? They were for Christ. They were Christians. They were pro-Jesus. They were pro-Jesus. This is something I think here at Huntington Beach Church we've, we've really learned how to do well. We're just pro-Jesus, amen? 
I mean, it's just all the time we're rallying people together to encourage them to trust in Christ, get baptized, join the church, join the way. And we don't get caught up in everything else that's going on. And if you want to, if you want to get people changed, if you want to get rid of certain things in their life, you don't necessarily have to just bash those things or judge people or condemn people. You know what you do? You give them Jesus. Because when people get Jesus and they really get him, they start getting rid of all that other stuff. Amen? That's what happens. Now, for some people, it may take a long time for them to get rid of it, but we're patient. Amen? Because we know God's patient with us. I think there's some wisdom here. This church became the great church of Ephesus. Because they were known for their love for Jesus and his word and not anything else. And God blessed that. Number four and finally, the way. You know, I've been underlining at first the way, way, it's all about the way. But this, the last thing is the word the. They named their church the way. The. What is the? It's very exclusive. It's the way. It's the only way to live. It's not one of the ways. Yes, we believe that Christianity is the only right way. In a pluralistic world, when we're being kind and we're being generous and we're being patient, we're also not compromising. We're letting you know, listen, we love you. We will accept you like you are, but we're going to be real honest with you. There's only actually one God. There's only one way to live. There's only one right way to do it. You either live your life the way, you live it the way, or you will lose your life. It's one or the other. If you live your life your way, you're going to lose your life. We, we tell people that not to be mean and not to be judgmental. We're saying it full of grace and love, saying, listen, dude, I'm telling you, man, your, road, your life is headed toward a dead end. If there's destruction right around the next corner. There's only one road to live and walk and ride, and that is the way of Jesus Christ. It's the only one that's really going somewhere. It's the only one that's going to really bless you. It's the only one that's going to give meaning and purpose to your life. And life is still going to be life. We Christians, we still have our problems. We still get cancer. We still have Things happen in our homes, in our marriages, with our children, with our finances and our businesses and with our own emotions. And there's, life still happens to us, right? We're not immune to that. It's just the fact that in the middle of life, we're now on a way. We're, we're, we're connected to Christ and his church and his truth, and it is making the difference. We are not only surviving this life, we are thriving in the middle of this life. Amen? Everything that's happening to us, God is turning into a blessing. Everything that even the devil is trying to do to us, God is using it for good, you see. That's the difference. People will spend all their money on the things of this world that will not pay them back. They'll live this this life for this world. There'll be no love, no satisfaction. There'll be disease, loss of health, loss of family, finances, loss of hope, loss of reason to live. And then there are those who have joined the way, Christianity. And they find that to be an investment that keeps giving back. True love. Soul satisfaction. Health of mind and body, family stability, financial freedom, full of hope and reason to live. And so I don't think it's any coincidence that this church named themselves The Way. And where did they get that from? Put on the screen John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here's the exclusivity of it. No one gets to the Father. No one gets saved. No one goes to heaven except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is all about Jesus. 
And we must be all about Jesus. That church was all about Jesus, and God blessed them for it. And when the chips were down and the world went nuts, this church thrived. And by the way, it was a small church. It wasn't very big. But now, 2,000 years later, one-third of the world's population claims to be part of the way. <laughs> just let God do his thing. Amen? Let's just be faithful. God is redeeming his people. Let's just do our part. And let's be true to the way. Our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that we take the wisdom of this chapter and continually apply it to our church, that we can make a difference. And Father, we have said even more boldly in these last year and a, in the last year and a half that no matter what happens outside in the world, no matter what goes on, we're going to stay faithful to you. We're going to stay with you. We're not going to change. We're not going to change our anything. We're going to stay faithful to the Word of God and to preaching Jesus and being pro-Jesus. And we know that you are the answer. You are the answer in our lives, and we know you're the answer for our neighbors. And God, we just want to love them and share with them your love. And we pray that in your timing and in your way and to your glory, you will save the people of our city and the surrounding greater area around this city. Father, all the people that are coming, and even those that are watching now online from all over the world, we pray, Father, that your truth would prevail and it would set people free from this world. Lord, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.